All right, here we are. 100 episodes of Horror Timelines. This all started uh, six years ago today with a very simple Friday the 13th timeline. And I've covered and recovered a lot of great series. And you know, there's plenty more films out there to cover, but I figured that episode 100 should be something really special. So I'm finally going to do the ring timeline. I know that you've all been patiently waiting, waiting for the... What? We're, we're not? We're not doing the ring? Well, what are we doing? We went bigger? Bigger than that? But we already did the Amityville movies. We're redoing it. All of them. Every single one of them. Excuse me. I'll take uh, everything. This all starts off back in 1979 with the Amityville Horror, which was based on the book of the same name, which was based on a real life event that happened. Even if the priest that they say went to the house gave an affidavit that he only contacted the Lutzes by phone and didn't go in the house even though they say he did, and claimed that there were cloven hoof prints in the snow, even though there was no snowfall during the period the family was in the house. And like, not a single inhabitant of the house after the Ludzes encountered a single weird event, but you know, true. It begins in November of 1974 as Ronald DeFeo Jr. kills his whole family in the house and then one year later in 1975 it's purchased by Lois Lane and Thanos' dad. They have a couple of kids and the priest stops by to bless the home but oh no, not flies. Flies will... What um... What, what, what will they do again? Be... An annoying? But then, get out! Funny, I just heard that same voice approximately two minutes ago at the start of doing this video. Having a costume designer for a wife makes me wonder if they were trying to make dad and kid shirts blend together right here, or if they possibly could have found Margot's other leg warmer somewhere. I don't know. The house starts to influence George, and I want you to imagine this guy right here being told, oh, oh yeah, James Brolin is going to play you. Bad stuff keeps happening, like toilet tar, vomiting nuns, <laughs> magically missing catering money because you know how much demons love cold cash, and let's evaluate this. Uh, dude's counting the catering money, and it's all there. Goes to hug his sister, turns around and George has entered the room looking like total crap and suddenly now the money is magically gone. George heroically offers to pay the caterer but guess what? 
the check bounces. So, in the book, of course, it's some mysterious demonic event, but considering that the real life George was known to be in deep financial trouble at the time, I'm gonna let you put together where that money really went. The priest asks them to close the house, but the damn mayor won't do it because of tourism or something. And I love that you're in the 70s and you're making a movie and you say, hey, we need a guy to try to convince someone that something unusual is going on, but we need another guy to laugh at him and say, no. Get me Murray Hamilton. <laughs> A little time passes and we push into 1976 and things get more intense with glowy eyes out the window and some church chaos. And then finally, George comes apart. Mother of God, he comes apart. The finale sees a glowing eyed pig and almost another murder as the family flees the house. Okay, things are getting confusing already because three years later in 1982, a sequel was released entitled Amityville 2, The Possession. But the poster tells us there was a family before them, so it appears as if it's going to be a prequel. A new family is moving into the house with Polly as the dad, and his daughter is Susie Putterman. Things get confusing with the time frame, considering that Sonny here has a Walkman, which wasn't invented until 1979. And I love the notion that the house needs this mirror to spy on the kids. Like, isn't it everywhere in the house? Why does it need to do this? Dad's abusive, and this family is called the Montellis, not the DeFeos, which could indicate that this isn't a prequel after all, and is instead a sequel, and the events are occurring again, repeating history with a new family. But they don't really say the DeFeo name in the original film, so it could be that it's intended that this was the family in that one, and the name is just different. And you see, this is why they have to print this is not a toy on every plastic bag you see, because 80s kids were doing stuff like this. The priest here has a book entitled How to Think About God in his car, which was first published in 1980, again indicating that this isn't actually 1974 here. There's like a monster paw in the basement and uh, Sonny's stomach gets shrunk and his brain expanded like it's Cronenberg's Amityville or some such. And then brother and sister get a little too close, like some sort of Pornhub category or something, and scary German guy pops in. And then, under the evil sway, Sonny kills his family. But here's the thing. What they show greatly differs from how they showed the killings in the first film. In that one, the family was all in their beds, but here, everyone is awake. No one seems to mention hey, this same thing happened in this same house just a little while ago, which would seem to give some more ammo to it being a prequel. But in the police station, it says that the next court is on March 2nd, 1982, and that there is no court in February, which would indicate that we're actually set in February of 82, not 1974. So there's no way this can be a prequel. It's after the events of the first film. They realize that the devil's in him and they go over the history of the house and it's on an Indian burial ground, but yeah, no mention of previous murders. And then the movie just pretty much becomes The Exorcist. After the whole thing, there's some pretty wild practical effects revealing the demon underneath and the house explodes into flames. Sonny is freed from evil, but you know, uh, still goes to jail for murdering his family, and it's revealed that the evil is now in Father Adamski. And hey, Rocky Poster. Um, that came out in 1976, so still no prequel. But what is it then? Well, it's either just a sequel, and no one mentions the previous murder out of the town trying to hush things up, or this is just a completely separate continuity in which the DeFeos and Lutzes didn't happen. And this is the first incident, and it occurred in 1982, whatever it was. <laughs> 
Just one year later, in 1983, things continued with Amityville 3D, directed by Richard Fleischer, and the house is for sale once again, and starts with a seance in which Tony Roberts and Candy Clark expose some frauds who have been renting the house. They find the hole in the basement, and it's said that the charlatans have been in the house for six months. And this guy says he bought the house, hoping to sell it once the scandals had been forgotten. But it hasn't been forgotten, so John actually buys it. His daughter is Aunt Becky, and those darn flies are up to their old tricks again. And this one is actually sort of based on real life as well. And an investigator named Stephen Kaplan spent some time trying to prove the Lutz's story was a hoax. And I guess this movie is a sort of a what if it wasn't kind of thing. The evil's not limited to the house here, since it follows John into this elevator, but it also has the ability to blast powdered sugar all over people. Melanie throws out some dialogue that will sound very familiar to Thrill Kill Cult fans. I don't want another one of your rational explanations. I know what I experienced and I'm not crazy. And Sally is here. Do you know you can have sex with a ghost? I did not know that, but I guess... Um, noted. And here's where we get wonky as far as timelines go. Lisa here tells the story of the DeFeos, and she calls them by name. The first time in the series that the DeFeo name is used. She never mentions the Montellis, only the DeFeo killings, suggesting that those never happened. Seems weird to talk about one set of infamous murders and then not mention the ones that would have just occurred like a year or so ago. Now there's a few ways to go here, and the first is that this isn't actually a sequel. I mean, it says it's not on the poster itself. So, it's possible that this film stands alone, and that 3 in the title isn't a 3, but simply a part of the notification of the 3D aspect. But hey, this was also released as Amityville 3, The Demon, so it's a part of this series, but just maybe in a separate continuity continuity in which the DeFeo murders happened and the Lutzes had their thing, but the events of part two never did. It's also possible that the Montelli stuff was kept kind of quiet and that somehow they were able to suppress that story or the connection to the house and that those murders did occur. Susan drowns and they decide to do a full-blown investigation and there's a confrontation in the basement and the demon actually shows up in the well and kills Elliot, dragging him into the well. The house then explodes, but oh no, there's still a fly. Uh, not a fly. So since they don't actually say the date here, we'll go with Real Time 83. And I guess I'll roll with this being a sequel, but with the Montelli murders uh, are much lesser known. I mean, it is the same demon. Part 3 was a bit of a bomb, so there wasn't much of a follow-up until 1989 with the made-for-TV film Amityville 4 The Evil Escapes, but was also aired as Amityville Horror The Evil Escapes, with no numeral. The house is fully intact once again, so either this takes place before the ending of Part 3, Part 3 takes place in a separate continuity, or the house used its evil magic to reconstruct itself. A group of priests arrive to exorcise the house, and the house destroys this painting, which, you know, I, I don't blame it. There's this spooky looking lamp that really matches all the rest of the decor, don't it? And then the real estate agency sells off the stuff in a yard sale, and this lady buys the lamp and ships it to her sister in California. And this family moves in with Alice here, and it's Patty Duke, and I think I've already made the hot dog joke about her once this year, so I'll abstain but she also has this small old man with them because I forgot about this kid and just how much he looks like a little boy and a 30 year old at the same time. The evil goes from the lamp and into the house and Alice is reading a paper with a news story about something that happened in February of 1989. So it would seem that we're in real time here. This priest talks about the house and keeps saying a dozen years ago the house changed his concept of evil and then talks about the 74 murders, but then says that a dozen years ago he changed his mind that the house is evil, but if he's talking about the DeFeo murders then that would make this 86? Or is he talking about the Lutzes incident? I doubt he's talking about the Montelli stuff since that would make it 1994, but okay, here's a premise. 
what if this takes place in 86 and the third takes place in 87? What if the real estate guy sells off the contents and then starts renting to the fraudsters from the beginning of that film and six months later John buys the house? That's what I'm rolling with. Well, none of that matters now because this happens. <laughs> They say that the lamp was purchased last week, so the intro was just a week ago, and the lamp causes some troubles. And of course, there's plenty of flies. And it comes down to a final battle in the attic with the priest from the intro to save little Jessica, and Grandma just straight up launches the thing out the window, saving the day. But oh no, evil cat. I mean, just say cat. So, this is where things switch up, since in 1990 there was the Amityville Curse, which is technically the first unofficial entry of the series, since it's not connected to the previous entries in any way, except that it's loosely based on the original book. This church sign lets us know that we're in 1977 and a priest is murdered, and then it jumps to 12 years later, so this one is set in 1989 and the booth the priest is killed in is stored in the clergy house in Amityville, and Marvin and his wife are buying it. Their friends come over to help them renovate it, and I made this joke in the previous video, but I just cannot get over how many times they say Marvin's name. Marvin. 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 Yeah, Marvin. 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 Tig Traeger is here, and it's told that a family just left the house with all their belongings behind, suggesting the Lutzes, and spooky stuff starts to happen, and they mention the story of the old house, saying it's cursed, and Frank starts going over the deep end, and no one mentions anything else as having happened in the house except for the thing with the priest. We learn that the priest was killed by his own illegitimate son, who then hung himself, and his spirit is now possessing Frank, and Marvin gets killed, so maybe now they can stop saying his name over and over. But then no, they just switch to saying Frank a million times. Frank! 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 She Harvey dents him and then straight throws a saw blade into his leg, and I guess the benefit of renovating a house is access to power tools like this nail gun, but he's not dead yet, so they spike him, which unleashes the spirit, and yeah, there's really no connection to the series. It's just another house with a ghost problem that happens to be in Long Island. There's some passing mentions about troubles in the town, but nothing concrete, so this can be in the regular continuity if you want it to be, since there's nothing to contradict anything else. We'll just say that it's the, the, an adi like another spooky house in the town. Now, here's where it gets wild. It's Amityville 1992. It's about time, although it sometimes drops the 1992 from the title, and it was the first in the regular series to go straight to video. Generally, when a movie has the year in the title, I assume that it's set in that year. So we'll say that for now, but then we'll see if anything contradicts it. We're in California again, and Sean's dad returns from a business trip to New York, and his kids are Jack Death's wife and Rusty here, and oddly, the woman watching the kids is Jacob's ex-girlfriend. Hey, whatever works. He's brought this antique clock back with him and says it came from a house that was torn down for a development he's handling. It's of course from the Amityville house, but if it were destroyed, then how could they have torn it down? So it's possible that the house that they're talking about being torn down wasn't the Amityville house and was a different house that was torn down for the development, but whoever had previously owned that house had purchased the clock from that yard sale and then just left it behind in that house. It starts doing some wild stuff right away and dad gets attacked by an awesome dog hand puppet, but when it seems like the attack didn't happen, Rusty has it all figured out. It's like that Skull Crusher song. Evil rules, it has the tools, but the world's your oyster, grab her and hoist her. Oh yeah, dude, it's exactly like that. Soon there's time distortions and the old black tar, uh, not, not, not see graffiti. And, and then Andrea, after having slept with Jacob, 
her ex-boyfriend, then invites her new boyfriend over to Jacob's house, and hey, Dick Miller, uh, always a plus. Then Andrea bangs her current boyfriend in her ex-boyfriend's house, which is questionable. It's then noted that the clock previously belonged to an evil inventor and necromancer from the 15th century who was super evil. So here's the thing. Is the movie insinuating that the Amityville house wasn't cursed? After all, it was just this clock the entire time? That it wasn't the devil and instead was this Gil Delay guy? Then, in this moment that I would like to nominate for the most comical death in a non-comedy film, this woman is killed by the apparently super sharp beak of a stork mounted on top of a truck. Jacob becomes more and more unhinged, Lisa becomes saucier and saucier, and Dad makes a whole little Amityville toy village, which is pretty awesome. And the whole Nazi thing is real out of left field in this. I'm not sure what they're trying to imply. There's the graffiti, and Dad has a German gun at one point. I'm not sure why it's in here. Rusty kills a possessed Lisa, who's trying to do an Amityville 2 reenactment with him, and they face off against Jacob, killing him. But oh no, Rusty is transformed into a child, complete with kid mullet, and Andrea realizes she has to destroy the clock but it fights back, turning her into an old woman, and she causes a gas explosion, destroying the clock. This resets time, uh, somehow returning everything to the beginning of the movie, and Andrea is able to destroy the clock before it does anything, and... What the hell was that all about? It's about time, that's what. Oh, I see what you did there, title of the movie. One year later, we continued with another straight-to-video entry with 1993's Amityville, A New Generation. And in case you weren't following along, there hasn't been a numbered title since Part 3, although Evil Escapes was titled Amityville 4 after the fact. If you're counting Curse as part of the series, this is Part 7, but if not, I guess it's 6. This one's in Los Angeles, and we've got Keys and his girlfriend here, and hey, it's Max. They they call him Mad Max. And there's an American werewolf in Los Angeles. Or wait, is it Philadelphia? Because it sure looks sunny out there. And yeah, if you're curious, Patty's Pub is actually right here in LA. Go figure. Keyes gets this old mirror from a bum and he gives it to his neighbor and it kills Grady, showing off the old Ocean Avenue windows in the reflection. And then the stepfather is here investigating. Keys starts having nightmares, and Suki is driven to suicide. The bum from the beginning turns up dead, and his name is Frank Bronner, and 26 years ago in Amityville, he killed his whole family. And it's said that it was a famous case in which he claims he was possessed by the devil. They say he was released from the asylum seven years ago when Reagan cut the budgets for mental institutions and hospitals were forced to basically put their patients out onto the street, which is a real thing that happened back in the early 80s. But then we see his gravestone, which reveals that he's Key's father, but also that it's November of 1993. Now, this raises a ton of questions. They say he murdered his family 26 years earlier, so that was 1967, seven years before the DeFeo killings. If this was indeed a thing that happened, why would no one mention that in the previous films? Like, after DeFeo killings, why didn't someone say, oh, hey, about seven years ago, this same thing happened? It, it would be one thing to say that perhaps people just didn't know about it, but Clark says it was a famous case. Unless this movie is just in a different continuity and has nothing to do with the other movie. I mean, it's called A New Generation, so maybe this is a reboot. And then Nurse Elise pulls Bronner's file from a storage bin marked 66, not 67, and says he was admitted in December of 66, so I guess it's actually 27 years, and they were just off with saying that earlier. His murders were committed at Thanksgiving dinner, so the details were different than the DeFeo killing, so it's not even like they're just trying to swap the name. Everything ends up in an art show in which Keyes intends to recreate the dinner murders as a therapeutic art piece, and it seems for a moment that he might actually do it, but he shoots the mirror instead, breaking the curse. 
It took three more years for another entry, which happened in 1996 with Amityville Dollhouse and was directed by Steve White. And although he's very active as a producer, this remains his only directing job. A family moves into a new house because a solid 80% of Amityville movies start with someone moving into a new house, even if it's not the actual Ocean Avenue one. And much like The Evil Escapes, this one also features a kid who is like 12 years old, but also somehow 35. Dad finds this dollhouse in the shed and it looks pretty familiar, and there's a newspaper here about a house burning down, killing a family. Weird fire stuff starts occurring around the house and psychic aunt and uncle pick up the bad juju, and I'm not sure how this works, but a mouse goes into the dollhouse and then appears as a giant one under a bed, which is kind of weird to think about. like. Jimmy then grabs the mouse out of the dollhouse, so shouldn't his giant hand then appear somewhere? Dead Dad starts showing up, and why are the Amityville movies seemingly as obsessed with incest as The Hub? The second movie had a brother and sister doing it, It's About Time had a sister trying to seduce her brother, and now this one has a stepmom lusting after her stepson. Like, I was pretty sure that she was going to get stuck in this fridge, if you know what I mean. In case you were thinking that maybe they're having some sort of weird continuity thing with the fire in that paper, and they're now saying the Amityville house burnt down, it's revealed that the newspaper fire happened in the same house they're in now, and the house was rebuilt. So the only connection is the dollhouse, which was apparently made of the Long Island one for some reason, and possibly had been there? or just adopted its evil? In fact, no one talks about the events of Amityville at all, and the word Amityville is never once said in the film. The rules of the house seem to change, like it does make a giant hand here. Uh, there's probably the silliest thing in the franchise so far. I can't escape the pentagram. And Zombie Dad tries to kill off the family, and Jimmy tosses a voodoo doll of him into the fireplace, making him disappear. And Dad jumps in and has to face down several demons there, which were actually just whatever spare special effects were lying around soda effects, and they toss the dollhouse in the fire, which destroys it and the evil. Um, oh, and their house. As they drive away, we can see their license plate sticker expires in 1996, so that's probably our year here. The series was put on a shelf for around nine years until 2005's inevitable remake. It was from Platinum Dunes, who was remaking everything around this time, and again picks up in November of 1974 to show us the DeFeo murders. High hopes, huh? I don't have them. They actually use the DeFeo name, and then we jump one year later to 1975, and we meet our new Lutz family. And again, I want you to imagine George Lutz, the real guy who looks like this, being told, oh hey, you are being played by Ryan Reynolds. Kathy is now played by Melissa George, so I hope this isn't a time loop or anything. And they buy the house, of course, and they move in with Little Hit Girl, who sees little ghost Jody DeFeo around. George switches from being, well, Ryan Reynolds as Ryan Reynolds, to being jerky guy super, super fast, and crazy stuff happens very quickly, and unlike the first movie, we see it. Oh, we see it all. And that includes Reynolds' abs. We see them, like, a lot. Then, in the movie's biggest commitment to realism, this is the babysitter. Like, come on, Kathy Lutz is in a troubled marriage and hires this babysitter that is like five or six years younger than her husband who has, uh, need I remind you, these abs. Like, she was just saying, oh yeah, this is who I want walking around my house and husband. But that's okay because apparently she's more interested in seducing this 12-year-old kid. What? What is going on with this movie? Things just keep getting more intense and uh, just, you know, hold on. I, I need to see something here. Uh, Christy, can you 
Can you solve this for me? Yeah, so um, I just checked and it looks like the costume department saved about $150,000 just by not providing shirts for Ryan Reynolds. Very creative budgeting. The priest shows up and it's Floyd Gondoli and hey, did you know that Philip Baker Hall was in Ghostbusters 2? We got meter maids chasing ghosts all over Midtown. There's then, as opposed to the priest scene happening in the first 15 minutes or so of the original film, it happens at just past the hour mark in this one. And then there's the story of a guy named Ketchum who killed people on the land where the house is, and eventually George picks up that shotgun, leading to a whole finale that basically just says, true story, what true story? We have speedboat escapes and shaky-headed ghost girls, come on. Okay, get ready, because here's where this goes off the rails. In 2011, The Asylum, legendary bad mockbuster makers decided to put their own spin on the franchise with The Amityville Haunting, which actually doesn't even feature an opening title for the movie. It starts off with a recap of the dates for the DeFeo killings and Lutz stuff, but oddly, say that they were driven out of the house over the next two years, even though they actually left in about a month or so. But I guess in this universe, they stayed for two years and left in 77 instead. Then it says that 32 years later, the presence has returned. So I guess we're in 2009 now and says what we're watching is real. And you know what that means, found footage. Yay, nothing I like better than low budget, hastily made found footage horror. They're at the Amityville house and, I, and it's insinuated that here, I guess no one lived there after the Lutzes and the house is still in the same state that it was back then. The house is still there as well, so it's clear that the other films in which it was destroyed are not in continuity in case you wanted to make this official. And some kids that break in are killed. There's then this family that are buying the house and what? This house has sat unsold for 32 years and just now they're selling it? The house is magically in a way more residential area, but then Oops, it's June 2008, so I guess that over the course of two years thing meant the remainder of 75 and into 76, which is pushing it considering they moved into the house in December of 75. So to make that 32 year and 2008 number work, they, they still would have to be in the house for one year or less. But yeah, I guess 75 and 76 is technically two years. Theoretically, I guess if they moved in in the December of 75 and moved out January of 76, that's round about two years, sure. So why do I have it in for low budget found footage? Well, because it's hard. I, I love well done found footage because it's way harder to pull off. You, you have to have actors that sound like they're truly not acting, so they have to be really good. If they're not, you get this. Whoa. My sister's door just opened. Let's go investigate. This is also one of those movies that not only features a character that continues filming everything for literally no reason, but then also just carries the camera around and I guess sets it down on things while it continues to coincidentally catch ghosts. Spooky stuff happens like doors opening by themselves and 315 comes back into play again and the flies are here. Oh, and uh, chopping wood, like the most low rent remake possible. And what's weird is that they keep talking about a little boy ghost named John Matthews saying it was a little boy that died there. And I think they're talking about Josh Matthew DeFeo, not Matthews and makes me wonder if they were skirting around using the real last name for legal reasons. But they had already used it in the intro. And, and, then, and then wait, this cop says that eight different families have lived in the houses after the Lutzes, but then why in the beginning did they say that the original furniture was still there? Did all eight families just keep all the furniture there? Um, what, uh, what was the thinking here? He says all this while a ghost just chills in the hallway. What are you doing there, ghost? Just standing there having a think? Like, is he just there like, all right, stay still. Don't, don't make any noise. 
just listening in. How, how boring is a ghost's life that they're just like, oh well, I'll just stand here for a bit. Dad goes nuts and something comes in to kill everyone, all off camera, of course, it's, it's cheaper that way. And yeah, I'm already regretting this whole decision. This is only the first unofficial entry. I have such a long way to go and yep, I already, already hate myself. This is so, so far the absolute worst of the series. I will let you know when something tops it. Two years later, another unofficial entry was released with Amityville Asylum, which was written and directed by Andrew Jones, who would go on to make all of those Robert the Doll movies. So already, you should have a bad feeling. Although those weren't vomitously terrible, just kind of dull. The opening tells us that it's 1974 and we get the DeFeo murders again and then jump ahead to 2013 and we're in Amityville and a young woman is hired at the High Hopes Psychiatric Hospital. And even though this is clearly definitely Long Island and not England, everyone here has a British accent or sounds like a British person doing an American accent. Go figure. She gets the job and meets some of the patients like Mrs. Hardesty and ending up in this crap isn't the biggest indignity a Hardesty will suffer this year. They have a John Doe there who they found six months ago and there's this orderly here and it's the same guy that plays the toy maker from the Robert movies just without all the weird old age makeup that he wore in those. She sees Mrs. Hardesty in the halls, but later finds out that she died earlier and gets verbally abused by some of the more psychotic patients. And it's revealed that the hospital was built on the grounds of the old Amityville house. And then, and, and then, and then, oh, oh. Sorry, we're told that on November 13th of 2013, six souls will be sacrificed and they end up locking up Lisa because the director is actually the head of a cult and they give a gun to that John Doe, who I think is supposed to actually be Ronnie DeFeo. I, I guess this was a part of the original plot, but scenes talking about it were deleted, so the identity of the patient is never actually revealed. Lisa manages to kill the shooter, but is mistaken for the killer and shot by police. A year passes, so in 2014, the doctor says he now has a book called High Hopes, Broken Dreams. And did I mention that this was made for 20 grand? Um, it's, it's possible that Andrew Jones pocketed 17 of that. Two years later in 2015, because can you believe that there was once a point that there were years that there were no movies with Amityville in the title released. Oh, to have lived in those years. <laughs> I mean, I did, but I want them back. But Amityville Playhouse was released, also known as the Amityville Theater. This one is directed by John R. Walker, who is mainly an actor and mainly an actor in Dustin Ferguson films. And this is another one in which the characters are in the Amityville area. So they're based in Long Island, but suspiciously, again, a large number of them have an English accent because again, this one was mostly shot in the UK. Fawn here inherits the Roxy Theater, which is abandoned, but weirdly they're advertising a show for 2015. So I guess this is well after that. She invites her boyfriend and friends to come help clean it up, and they say that Halloween was two weeks ago, so it's probably in November then. A runaway? Hey, imagine seeing that face on a milk carton. Turn it into cheese. What? What does that mean? They end up locked in, and then there's a poster up advertising a show on November, not, not November 15, of 2015. So we are in 2015. Hold on a minute. Skull Crusher? It's like that Skull Crusher song. It's all connected. And they find a squeegee board there. So yeah, uh, locked in an old theater, said to be haunted, where several of you have been seeing weird things. Break that sucker out and let's play. 
And Fawn's professor is still helping to find out the history of the theater. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, Wayne. Uh, we're fine, thank you. Okay, all right. Well, it's an easy round then, isn't it? I mean, doesn't this scene scream Long Island, New York to you? I think this might be a flashback to when he was in England, but there's really uh, nothing to denote that. And I guess I should point out that Professor Victor here is played by the director, and the kids start to go missing. And interestingly, they're told that six people are killed on a particular date, which is actually the same plot point that Amityville Asylum has. So it may be connected, I guess? It seems that they have to sacrifice six people or else the evil spreads to the rest of the world. And I guess if you want to connect this to the previous film, it's certainly possible. The original house isn't really mentioned here, but it's more implied that the curse is on the town of Amityville itself and not the house in particular. The whole town is evil, I guess, and the demons want to get out and Fawn is taken over and kills the prof. Also in 2015, there was Amityville Death House by Mark Polonia. Okay, um, here we go. It's a uh, Polonia o'clock. I knew it was coming. Do I have, do, do I have enough drinks? So far, these unofficial movies have been pretty unimpressive, and I kind of remember hating this one, but I've since grown a pretty big tolerance for Polonia's um, uh, unique style of filmmaking. 300 years ago, a witch was killed, and a warlock with a voice by Eric Roberts says that he'll get revenge using the Book of the Dead. And of course, of course. Ken Van Sant is here, but I guess he's not playing Duke Larson for once. And John Miglior, another Polonia regular, and a group of four teens go to Tiffany's grandmother's house. And I guess it's supposed to be the Amityville house, cause windows and fly. Grandma is definitely an old woman, and not just someone in weird old age makeup, and things in the woods start killing. And again, I'll point out that the plot revolves around the killing of six people within a certain time frame. And the book reveals that Abigail was killed in 1853. So if she says that she was killed 300 years ago, I guess this is set in 2153. Um, sh sure. Polonia regular, this guy is here, and so is this guy. And after six people are killed, and it's revealed that Tiffany is a witch and a descendant of bad guy Abigail. They know this because she, um, ha has six, six boobs. Abigail rises and they realize that they have to burn the book and house, but Abigail possesses one of the friends and turns them into a spider creature, which I have to admit is pretty cool. Like not worth the time to get to this, but cool nonetheless. They burn the house, which I should stress is not the original house, the address is different and the only link to the franchise is the town it's set in, with the whole death of six people thing, sure. In the end, it appears as if Abigail has possessed Tiffany, and there's no real date given in this one, uh, I mean, unless you really want to go with 2153, but let's go instead with real time 2015. And, and, and you know, this is bad, but it's not Amityville haunting bad. Here we go now with 2015's Sickle. And hey, it's called Sickle, so why is it on this list? Well, because it was also released as Amityville, the final chapter, much like Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, and Saw, this is definitely going to be the final one. I'm sure of it. There's an opening with a child who killed his babysitter, and then we bounce ahead 15 years, and they say he's 27, so he did the murder at 12, and we have this girl who's home from college. That paranormal stuff is really popular now. Yeah, well, so is the Pet Rock. Pet Rock? Popular? What decade did this guy think that this is? Kim joins up with her friend who's a paranormal investigator, and the kid gets released and walks right into a Mentos commercial. It's back to school before I know, and my summer's all behind. It's no fun to be alone when the sun is going down. 
They say that this theater had deaths in 68 and 90, and Mike says that he didn't kill the babysitter, and instead a creature with a sickle did it. And then this movie has this character that's possibly my favorite ever. He's supposed to be a very old man, and it's clearly a guy that's not terribly old in a frosted beard, but I guess he thought it would make himself sound old to talk like this. Let's get the home repairs and the yard work under control before we delve into conversation. I have a feeling our discussions will last far longer than any mowing of grass or patching of cement. They then say that the babysitter killing was in 1995, so this film is set in 2010 then, and they trick him into going back to the house that the murder happened. And it turns out that the old man's wife was killed by the creature whose name is Sickle, and he's from another world and travels to ours to create chaos, and they finally call him up to take him on, and I guess I should point out that he's a guy in a wig and a cheap Halloween mask wearing a top hat and has like a pig pig nostrils or something. We get the least convincing action sequence of all time and the film just kind of ends like, like the sickle plot just ends and Mike is reunited with his parents who are somehow only about five years older looking at him and I guess I should say that there's Absolutely no mention of Amityville here. There's no link to anything at all. There's no reason for this to be called Amityville, the final chapter. It's a different house, different town, different demon, and it's just a whole different thing. And I should point out that it is a thing that I hate. Okay, the real test comes now with 2016's Amityville vanishing point and let me break down just the first couple of minutes. A woman in a nightgown with slit wrists stumbles down some steps and is discovered by a man in a pink jacket who pours her some milk and then hobbles away. That's how this starts and it's all downhill from there. So some notes about this one before getting into it. First of all, it was made for $1,000 by an 18 year old and was apparently inspired by the works of David Lynch. Knowing that, be prepared to feel like it was made for around a thousand bucks and feel like it was directed by an 18 year old, but not really feel anything like David Lynch. The story here involves a couple of girls staying in a boarding house and they discover that one of their friends the girl from the beginning has died. The boarding house is called the Amityville Boarding House, thus giving us our title, and we know this because of this very real looking and not at all cardboard sign. There's this oddball uh, ta tap dancing police officer on the case, and eventually there's some ghost stuff, but there's no date, so I'm just calling it 2016, and man, do I want to just point to the things in this movie that are just really hard to watch, and, I, and I'd love to make fun of it, but you know what? An 18-year-old guy got the wherewithal and the inspiration to get out there and make a movie. Yes, it's extremely unpolished and fake edgy, and if it's trying to do David Lynch, um, maybe it shouldn't, but I have to give credit where credit is due. If I put up the things that I was making at 18 years old, I'm not sure that I could say that it would be any better. So guess what, Dylan Greenberg? I'm giving you the props. And besides, even though this is bad, it's not Amityville haunting bad. We now dive right into the deep end with 2016's Amityville Legacy, which is now known as Amityville Toy Box, and this is the first entry directed by our friend Dustin Ferguson, so we all have high hopes here. It starts in 1974 and gives us yet another recreation of the DeFeo murders, and I straight up have to talk about how much I love this score. I don't know if this was stock music or made for the film, but it actually sets a nice tone. It then says that it's 40 years later, so this one is set in 2014, and it's a big family party for Dad's 50th birthday, even though he doesn't look that much older than most of the other people there. But I guess this guy just uh, ages well. 
He gets one of those monkeys clanging cymbals as a gift, and it's said that it came from an antique shop, but at one point was in the original Amityville house. They never say that, but it's heavily implied, and he starts immediately acting crazy chopping wood like a Lutz. There's ghost stuff, and he's haunted by the spirit of his dead father, and you know what, I'm not, I'm not mad at this one. I mean, look, it's, it's not great, but as, as someone that now considers himself an aficionado of Ferguson films, this one's pretty solid. There doesn't feel like a ton of extra padding. There's a bit of flair to the styling, although I do feel uh, cheated that there's no browsing in this movie. How am I supposed to know what the inside of the stores in this town look like? Plus, it's an hour and 10 minutes long, so it moves quick, and this girl really nails that nervous ha hand performance. And there's some of that good old-fashioned Amityville incest, and Mark eventually offs the whole family to Feo style, and of course, my favorite moment of all. The gunshot wound that leaves blood on you, and yet doesn't rip your shirt. Dad kills Julia, and here's the thing, because this part is only in the toy box version, uh, but one week later, a paranormal investigator arrives, and she says that an evil object was brought into their house, and they say their dad is in their basement, but I guess this is the basement of this house? Like, it, like it's a sub little suburban home with the Kruger boiler room special, apparently. This whole scene is especially funny because you just know that it was shot much, much later because the film wasn't long enough. I mean, why else are you just now introducing multiple new characters in the last 10 minutes of a movie? Dad finds this clown painting, and then there's Kurt Cobain here, who I guess is the evil, and he took over a paperboy, like a 25-year-old like a paper paperboy, and he kills the woman, and that's it. Uh, that whole ending bit just did not need to be there. Uh, you remember what I said earlier about no extra padding? Ig ignore all that. The next entry is also from 2016, and it's The Amityville Terror by Michael Angelo, and it remains his only directing gig, and compared to our last few, seems to have some money involved. It looks like the budget was around $500,000, which I'm pretty sure is more than the last six or seven movies combined. It starts with a family moving, big surprise, 80% of all Amityville movies begin with a family moving into a big creepy house. The Jacobsons move in with their aunt, and they just start to shout at each other like within like five minutes. Yay. Daughter Haley meets a group of kids to confirm that the town that they've moved to is Amityville, even though they refer to it as a tiny town in the middle of nowhere, even though the actual town is like an hour out of Manhattan. And I know that that's not like a bustling city center, but it's a little goofy to refer to a place that's less than 50 miles away from one of the largest population points in the U.S. as the middle of nowhere. There's this truck in a driveway with red registration tags, which was the color for California in 2016. And I know they're in New York, but the family just moved for Los Angeles, and I guess that these are Cali plates. So we're probably in 2016, real time. There's this thing in this movie that I've seen a few times lately. Uh, Haley shows up and starts flirting with this guy, and the guy starts flirting back, and there's this whole thing between them but the guy already has a girlfriend. Naturally, that girl gets snippy because, well, uh, her boyfriend is making goo goo eyes and she's flirting back. But I guess we're supposed to view uh, the, the girlfriend as the crazy one in this situation? The house is on Amityville Way and not Ocean Avenue, so it's not the original house, but this guy says something bad happened there a while back where a kid poured acid in his little sister's bath, then killed his parents. While researching the murders on the internet, Haley sees search results for a TV show called The Willis Clan about this Christian country band that only ran from 2015 to 2016 before it was canceled because the dad was arrested for, um, some, some pretty terrible stuff, and is currently serving about 40 years in prison. But, uh, yeah, so we're probably in 2016 then. She also sees a press release for this fundraiser that's raising money for the Red Cross, and it seems like a fun event, considering that everyone is going to get drunk and have plenty of sex there. Hopefully that doesn't include Eleanor there. I mean, who does this guy look like? 
one of the Willis clan? They say that Haley moved into the Amityville house, and since it's not that Amityville house, and it seems to be that it's the only one with a bad history here, it would appear that this is absolutely not in continuity with the other films. It's just a different film set in Amityville that has a house with a past. And we see a file for the Jacobson family dated April 23rd, 2015 as the start date with no end date. So it's assumed that that's when they moved in. So we're actually in mid 2015 here. We also see the file for the previous family who lived there from January to February of 2015, and the town is evil, and that girlfriend is a baddie after all, and they have to feed people to the house or else the spirits will attack the town. She kills Teresa and goes home, but her parents have been killed by her possessed aunt. Haley stops her and then escapes, but then we see the real estate lady showing the house to the family from the beginning of the movie, showing that the evil continues on. This one's fine, kind of kind of boring, but professionally made at least. We now move on to 2016's Amityville, No Escape, which starts off with Blair Witch text to tell us that we're watching footage from 1997 and 2016. So that's when this one takes place. I guess it's going to be found footage and half is from the 90s and half from the time it was shot. A group is going into the woods to try to get an understanding of fear or something, and it's intercut with a young lady in 97, and I guess she just moved into the Amityville house, and there's lots of dead flies there. And in the 16 footage, they're going camping in Amityville as well. And why is the 97 girl filming herself sleeping? The, the premise is that she's filming a video log of herself to send her overseas husband. So I guess she wanted to send him footage of her sleeping all night. In 16, this guy says there's a bunch of Amityville movies, so it's clearly a separate continuity in which the Amityville movies are just that. So in case there was any doubt, it's its own thing. And look at this very real interaction. What are you doing out here? Oh, uh, uh, we're, camp we're camping. There's camping? What's with the camera? We're doing a project for school. See, this is what drives me bananas about low budget found footage. You get a lousy actor in there, and not only does it mean that you have a lousy actor in your movie, but you've now completely destroyed your illusion of reality. So your movie is double screwed, and the audience experience is ruined. She reads the house history, talking about the DeFeo murders and how a bunch of people who moved in afterwards moved out very quickly because of spooky stuff. Although I should point out that in our real world, only the Lutzes reported anything about the real house world. Every single family that moved in post-1975 said they experienced no supernatural occurrences. So, yeah, in 97, Lena has a series of mildly unusual things happen to her, and in 16, they see a girl in the woods, and everything takes a really long time to happen, and it gets Blair Witchy as they try to leave the woods and can't, and they start showing up dead, and they keep talking about this little girl, but every time they show her, she's clearly an adult, so I don't know what the deal is there, and they all end up dead, while in the past, something in the house kills Lena, and it's revealed to be one of the girls from 2016? I, I don't know, whatever. The, the thing is that apparently there, there was an early cut of the film that didn't have any of the 1997 stuff, and this film is about an hour and 20 minutes. So my guess is that they realized that the movie was too short, so they shot the other stuff, uh, according to IMDb, in one day and then just cut it in to pad time. It has no purpose being there since it doesn't have any relevance to the other plot, but then again, the other plot has no relevance to itself, so I guess it cancels itself out? Uh, sure. Dustin Ferguson returned to Amityville with 2017's Amityville Evil Never Dies, which was later released as Amityville Clown House, and it starts with a birthday party. And this guy has the clown painting that the dude found in the house at the ending of Amityville Toy Box. And when I say house, <laughs> I mean industrial boiler room. Um, birthday Boy's dad dresses as a clown and kills everyone and then himself. 
We then have a priest say that it started over 40 years ago in Amityville, so we're post-2014 then, which would be 40 years after the DeFeo murders, and he says it was destroyed a long time ago, insinuating that we're actually in continuity with the original films, as much as you want to call that continuity. But if it were destroyed in the third film, this is in keeping with that. He talks about the lamp from Evil Escapes, the clock from It's About Time, the mirror from New Generation, and the Amityville dollhouse from... can't remember what that one was called again. He then mentions the monkey from Legacy or Toy Box or whatever title you want to pick, and some thieves break into the house where the clown guy killed the fam and says it was a few weeks ago, and they're looking for the clown painting, and the clown shows up to kill them. We then end up in Jesse's Junk Drawer, a collectible shop that's run by the Scream Queen himself and sells this couple the monkey. I mean, I think so. I can't really hear him. I'm a monkey. Certainly it's one of a kind. I never gonna make these anymore. Let me get you a receipt. I won't be needing one. And, and I still love this. <laughs> <laughs> what on earth was that? Probably rats. It's that time of year. Like, have you ever seen a rat? Did you hear that noise? Was the rat playing drums? And then it would not be a Ferguson film without a walking scene. You know, most movies don't really let you see how characters get from point A to point B, but not here. Here you get to see the entire journey. The couple have arguments, again, I, th I think. Ben goes nuts and kills the prostitute, while Michelle is plagued by strange happenings around the house. Donna Lee shows up to offer some support. I, I think, again, I, I can't hear anything. She researches Amityville, and look, it's John Walker, director of Amityville Playhouse. It's all connected. See? Julia returns from Legacy, so it seems that she survived that film's finale after all, and she says that she found the monkey 40 years after the original killings. So yeah, that one is 2014. And we get 10 minutes of flashbacks of that movie, which on one hand, wow, uh, 10 minutes of a previous movie we've already seen, but on the other hand, hey, I can hear those scenes. Michelle shoots the monkey, stopping the evil, and Jesse comes to collect the pieces, and right now, you're asking yourself, hey, what does any of this have to do with the clown in the beginning and the clown painting? And the answer is nothing. Uh, I'm guessing that this part was all shot, and like the earlier film wasn't long enough to distribute as a feature, so the clown portion was shot separately and edited together as one movie. Judging from the credits, which lists these as additional scenes shot by another director, I'm gonna go ahead and say that that's the case. There's no date in it, so let's just say real time 2017 and three years have passed between this and Toy Box. And it turns out that that is the case, as confirmed by Dustin himself. And another fun fact, all of the audio issues that this film has are due to the transfer. It seems a company purchased the rights to release Amityville Evil Never Dies, and when they did the transfer, they somehow goofed up the audio and gave us the version that we hear right now. Um, a, a fact that Dustin is quite unhappy about. So if you want to hear this version with the intact audio, please check out the... Amityville Evil Never Dies version. 2017 had the one-two punch of Ferguson and Polonia, since Mark Polonia had Amityville Exorcism that starts off by telling us that we're in Amityville, and a guy murders his family with a hammer. And yep, Van Sant and Kirkendall right off the bat. It's a Polonia joint, all right. The murderer says he worked in the Amityville house and that a priest was killed exercising a demon there and that he took some of the lumber from the house home and used it for his house, which I guess carried over the evil. And there's an alcoholic dad and daughter and he also has some of the cursed lumber and there's a monster in the pool. Uh, then there's this guy in a red cloak and mask uh, around who seems to have magical powers and Amy ends up possessed, um, leading to, um, th this? Help me! Help me! 
So dad and the priest decide to have uh, an exorcism, which makes Amy's face all evil, except it stops at her hairline. And Jeremy's dead wife, who he killed in a drunk driving accident, is haunting him. And oh no, evil dolls. They perform the exorcism with pretty silly results, and they ultimately defeat Red Guy. And that seems to do the trick, but he finds a list of several other houses which use the haunted lumber, so his job isn't done. I didn't catch a date in this one, so it's also real time 2017 then. Also that year came a weird one called Amityville Prison, which was originally released as Against the Night, but was changed to Amityville Prison afterwards. This one has a bunch of kids having a party and one of them films the others having sex. And there's a file on his computer that I think is supposed to reference that video and says it's 2013, so that may be our date. Although it's possible, it's possible that's an old file. One of the friends has a paranormal investigation web show, so they decide to go shoot an episode in an abandoned prison, and there's stories there about mad doctors and experimentation. And for some reason, they collect everyone's phones, and then, um, for some other reason, everyone splits up. It's, it's like they read a book called How to Be a Horror Victim 101. They all start to have some sort of weird encounters, and these two find this room with a bunch of pictures up on the wall. What does that look like to you? Mm -hmm. Doesn't it look like a crop circle? Um, I'm, uh, looking at the shapes here. I'm not getting crop circle. I see another kind of circle, if you know what I mean. They find their friend Hank dead, and it seems as if there's someone there killing them. But Hank faked his dying, and they keep on bringing up the crop circle thing, and the person attacking them appears to be a dude in a mask. So we're mixing a ghost movie with an alien movie with a slasher? What is this supposed to be about? It turns out that the prison is being used as a meth lab, and they're being stalked by the chemists, and the police arrived. I'm having a hard time putting together a timeline here. Yeah, welcome to my world, dude! But then, and here's where this movie takes a turn, I guess, um, aliens? To be clear, an alien had a meth lab in a prison. And uh, yeah, in case you were wondering, this doesn't take place in Amityville. Has nothing to do with anything Amityville related and is literally just a name slapped on the movie to make it sell more copies. This is officially the first movie on this list that doesn't even try to link itself in any way. Although I guess you could say the same thing about Sickle, really. Things got more official in 2017 though with Amityville The Awakening, or at least as official as things get in this series. The opener sums up the DeFeo killings and then shows us the house, the first time that we've seen the thing in a while outside of a model or something. It then says 40 years later, and since they're talking about the killings in 74, that would place this in 2014, which is when it was filmed. A new family is moving into the home and it's Disney ex Bella Thorne and she's gonna be somebody's baby tonight. And, and yeah, this was filmed in 2014 and planned for release in 2015, but was then bumped to April of 2016 and then to January of 2017 and then again to June of 17 and then one final time to September of 17. It's the DeFeos, so it's not in continuity with two, and the house is still there, so it's not in continuity with three through nine or whatever. And Belle has a twin brother who's in a coma, and it's the Joker? Was he the Joker? I didn't watch that show. His monitor shows the date as April 4th, 2015 though, so I guess it's not 14 and instead 15. They show the monitor again a little while later, and it's now suddenly April 2nd, so whoa, uh, did I actually put on Amityville It's About Time again? That's some wild ghostery. It's then revealed that the Amityville Horror was just a movie in this universe, and Clarence Boddicker is here, and Belle starts to see things, and then James starts to wake up, leading to CGI flies. 
And since it's been a while since we've had some good old fashioned Amity incest, here's some sun on naked mom groping. They say that nothing scary has happened in the house for 40 years, and they make a point about the evil only surfacing every 40 years. And they say this after talking about the Lutzes and the original novel. So if they're talking about that incident, and then that's 1975, so the 2015 date would be correct. We get a classic get out shout out, and Jimmy starts creeping around like his name was Zelda or something, and then fills out and grabs a shotgun, kills mom, so she tosses him out of the house and drags him away, which kills him and stops the evil. Belle is blamed for the deaths, but her fate is uncertain since her sister corroborates her story. <laughs> 2018 continued a streak of Amityville movies seeming halfway professional with the Amityville Murders by Daniel Ferrans, who has sort of made a name for himself by doing film versions of real life murders. This is another adaptation of the DeFeo murders using their actual names, so I guess you could view this as the actual prequel to the Amityville Horror? We're back in 1974 and Diane Franklin is here as Louise DeFeo, returning from Amityville 2, now in an adult role. Burt Young is back too, now playing Ronnie's grandpa, and the kids do some occult stuff in the red room in the basement, you know, always a good choice. Ron Sr. is abusive, involved with the mob, and young Butch is showing signs of insanity, and the whole movie does this whole dance where they insinuate that there's supernatural stuff going on, but don't really, so I guess it's up to you if you want it to be there, like they could be psychotic delusions, I guess, I, I don't know. For, for something that's trying to be like, Here's the true story. There's a lot of bed covers moving by themselves. But then they straight up show magic pennies flying around a room. So yeah, um, so much for true story. Young Ronnie gets attacked by shadow people. So again, ju just a movie now, although I, I, that could just be an interpretation of his insanity. But you already had his sister seeing floating coins. So no. Finally, that night arrives and he picks up his shotgun and kills his whole family at 3.15 a.m. while they sleep. It ends with actual news footage from the aftermath and a tag with the Lutzes moving in. Remember what I just said a bit ago about professionalism? Well, that's gonna change with 2018's Amityville Mount Misery Road which is a real street and just happens to be around Long Island in New York, not far from the actual Amityville. This was written, directed, produced, edited, and stars Chuck and Carolina Morangello, who also do the music for the movie, and Chuck has a cool car, so of course we get to see him drive it for like a straight minute and a half. Sounds short, but in movie terms, a minute and a half of just a car driving around is eternal. He then goes inside and we're now eight minutes into this movie and literally all that has happened is the opening credits, a guy drove home, got his mail, and is now looking through his mail. It's very clear that Chuck here filmed himself on a tripod and then he just threw a digital zoom on the still footage, which is really obvious when stuff like this happens. Chuck gets photos of spooky orbs. Oh no! Not orbs! Chuck's character is Charlie, but his girlfriend is, um, bougie? They look on the internet, and there's some articles dated October of 16, so we're at least past that. And this is what you get when you don't have a script, and you set up a camera, and just improv your way through it. Without having any actual improv skills. Sleep is places. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. And if you goes crazy Mary, who is that? The woman in white? Look at this. Check this one out. New York's dangerous dead end road. This painting has a date of 2017, so it's past that then. And they look at pictures of Mothman. There's then a thrilling music video for one of Chuck's original songs, Shake That Booty. And 
and this random guy overhears them talking about Mount Misery Road and has this extremely natural interaction. <laughs> Interesting. Tell me more. There were rumors of strange lights in the sky. It's confusing because it's not found footage, it's a two shot with reverse angles. But this dude ends up just looking into the camera. So are, are we in Chuck's POV now? And I love that this guy is a complete expert on Mount Misery Road. He has detailed information about it and just drops it on this couple that mention it once and then asks them why they're going there. He asks them like seven times. This scene is like four minutes long and consists of about three sentences repeated over and over. My suggestion would be to stay away from Mount Misery Road. It's considered one of the most haunted places in America. You have no business going there. What are you going there for? Well, I'm warning you, stay away from Mount Misery Road. That land is cursed. So stay away from there. You don't need to go there because it's a very haunted place. Stay away from Mount Misery Road. That's cursed land. So I would say stay away. Stay away from Mount Misery Road. Then Chuck's like, hey, guys, did you know that my wife has a butt? You didn't? I, I didn't get that across with the shaking of the booty song? Well, allow me to demonstrate once again, in case you were not paying attention, that my wife has a butt. And then, in case the point still isn't clear, prepared for the duet entitled, Bougie Has a Nice Booty. It's a real to be around Christmas time, and I'm guessing it's Christmas of 2017. So look, I'm, I'm telling you what this movie is, or at least what it feels like. Chuck and Carolina were going back to Chuck's hometown for the holidays. I mean, he's, he seems like a Jersey slash Long Island kind of guy, and he figured, well, we're going on this trip. Let's just make this little movie while we're, while we're going there. Seriously, this movie is like... 75% home movie kind of thing with a couple of dialogue scenes with experts on Mount Misery Road telling them not to go there and plenty of opportunity to play songs by his band or just him or whatever and show off his wife and her bougie booty. You have to be a certain level of stupid to walk in there at this point after everything I've told you. T, do you think that they're gonna? Well, yeah, of course. And then they walk and see rocks and talk, having extremely natural conversations. She was okay. the crazy girl, supposedly, that she burned all the people in the hospital. There no! Was oh my god. Around the area here. I can't hear that anymore, you know? Are you serious about it? She's like walking around like that, like the ghost, like a real ghost. He tells her this story and she gets so scared she wants to leave even though it's the same damn story the guy in the bar told them and the other guy as well. And they were like, don't go. And they just laughed and went. But now suddenly, one quick story later, she's terrified. Babe. Babe. Yeah, babe, what's up? I need to go to the bathroom. No, really? <laughs> Something gets Charlie and Bougie finds his phone and then tries to get out of the woods and she walks and walks some more, making sure to film herself the whole way. And again, I'm not sure if this is supposed to be found footage or not, because if you're lost in the woods, why would you be filming yourself like this? But if it's not found footage, um, you can clearly see her shadow holding the camera. And she walks and walks and walks. It's like a solid 10 minutes of a single person wandering through the woods until something, I guess, uh, gets her. There's a final tag with a random guy finding Bougie's pants. So whatever happened to her has made her pantless. And he's attacked by the woman in white who is clearly just Bougie in a white dress. So what does this have to do with Amityville? Um, nothing. It was originally called Just Mount Misery Road and has no Amityville connections, except that the two areas are a short distance from each other. The word Amityville is never even mentioned. Yeah. 
Next up on the list is 2019's The Dawn. Wait, it, do it doesn't have Amityville in the title? Why am I doing it? Fine, let me look at IMDb. Here's the also known as section, and I don't see it ever being released as Amityville anything, so do I have to watch it? I do? Oh God, I hate you person that's just standing just slightly off camera that's not really there and is simply an extension of my own self-loathing and instinct for self-harm by watching bad movies. I hate you so much! So the dawn starts in 1922 and it's in Pennsylvania. We're not even in Long Island? What's going on here? I mean, the poster art just looks like a nun ripoff. I mean, should, shouldn't this just be in one of the ripoff list videos? There's a family and their dad seems to be a bit on edge and he kills his family. So I guess it's Amityville-ish. And young Rose survives and finds refuge in a convent and 10 years passes. So we're in 1932 now. And then all the standard sort of spooky stuff starts to happen. Like they said, oh hey, people seem to like these Blumhouse kind of horror movies. Let's just make one of those. Flies come out of Rose's mouth at one point, so I guess it's like kind of A-ville adjacent. It, it's soon apparent that she's possessed, so an exorcism is in order. All right, I, I give up. It, it, it's a nun ripoff. It's an exorcist ripoff, but it's not really Amityville. I'm, I'm gonna stop this. Keep going? Oh, I hate you so much. When they do the exorcism, oh, oh, wait. Um, okay, th those are familiar. It, it all goes kind of wrong, but Rose sacrifices herself to stop the evil, and then the young priest is headed to Long Island. Apparently now taken over by the demon, and he has a drawing of a familiar house, and the ending lets us know that he brought the evil to Amityville, and then there's this. Okay, okay, Gl glad I stuck it through. Okay, all right, yeah, this belongs here. As we go into 2020, the number of movies with Aville in the title increases, and 2020 gives us Amityville Island, which is Mark Polonia's third dip into the Amityville arena. He uses the same house from Amityville Death House here, and as we recall from that one, this is supposed to be the actual Ocean Avenue house. Or at the very least, we know that it's in Amityville since this character says so. This car has 2019 tags, so, so I assume that that's our year. And again, if you're a fan of the Poloni Pony, you'll recognize Jamie Morgan and Yoli Canales, and she's selling the stuff from the house, and it's the return of the red mask guy from Amityville Exorcism. Kelly Joe was taken over by a spirit from a doll from the house, and in Exorcism, the original house had already been destroyed, so I guess that the implication was that this house had been made with the haunted lumber? She kills her family and gets put in jail, and they, they, they say she's been there for over a year. So we're into 2020 now, and more Mark P regulars are present, and they transfer Kelly and Renata to some island, but the demon, um, enters a bear and attacks, and they're back at the same damn lake from all the Polonia shark movies, and how can I not include this shot of the cameraman in the reflective sunglasses to give you a peek at the Polonia process? I wonder if there's a crew. Nope, just a guy with a camera. And oh, there's zombies on this island, like this obviously not a guy in a mask zombie, and the demon also takes over a shark, to kill this guy and they're taken to this totally real research lab because I'm not sure if you realize how important that aluminum foil is to the scientific process. The demon starts to wreak havoc around the lab and to complicate things, the mad scientist there is trying to create a new master race, but the girls break loose. Dr. Orman gets attacked by a mask zombie who's having a hard time keeping the neck portion talked into the shirt, and Kelly Joe and Renata get away while the demon takes over the baby. The next entry that year was Witches of Amityville Academy, which begins in 1602 and gives us some witches being hung and then bounces to present day, possibly 2020. 
and was directed by Rebecca Matthews, who directed one of the bad nun movies I covered in my Conjuring ripoff video, and marks the first Amityville film directed by a woman, if you don't count Carolina co-directing Mount Misery Road. These robbers try to break into a house and face off against some women there with extra powers. And we then meet Jessica, and she's joining this new academy, the Amityville Academy. And she was also from Bad Nun. And it turns out that she signed up with some bad witches. She's rescued by good witch ladies who hold their hands up. They let her know that she's a witch and prepare to train her, which is mainly dancing in circles around her, I guess. The bad witches try to get Jessica back, giving us a thrilling battle, which um, everyone holds hands and, and stares. Those evil Amityville witches are trying to bring forth some demon named Botus, and they sure take their time doing it. But then in my favorite bit, they all have a dream in which Jessica is killed and wake up startled, even though Elena here is kind of more smirking. I'm not sure if like this is the only facial expression she has at this point, but this is not a look of shock. Finally, they battle, and when I say battle, I mean hold their hands up at each other, and evil Dominique sacrifices herself to call forth Botus, who is a dude with a pentagram on his head, but they defeat him by, yep, hand waves. That inspires this groundbreaking screenwriting. Demon. Dead. <laughs> we did it. Dead. Demon. <laughs> the ladies decide to take on the girls from Amityville Academy, but then they have to go to Salem. You gotta be kidding me. Get your hands ready. The next 2020 arrival was the Amityville Harvest, which was written and directed by Thomas J. Churchill, who has really been busting out a rapid fire series of genre flicks and starts at a funeral with a young woman trapped and attacked. And this woman gets a lead on the story. She's trying to follow about Abraham Lincoln and this guy at a bar. I mean, not a real bar, but like someone's bar in their basement. And then there's a vampire in the home and they head to the home with a full film crew and we're told that it's Amityville, which is curious because here's the house and they're saying that this is in Long Island, but am I in New York right now? Hmm? Did I take a trip to Long Island or am I right here in Los Angeles. We meet the house's owner, Vincent, and I think he's supposed to be an older guy, but no one just says, oh, hey, dude, you've got a little gray spray paint in your hair. You might want to just wash that out. And everyone starts seeing the grudge hairs flying around and pretty soon there's civil war ghosts just walking and they're making out like they're shooting a documentary about the Lincoln thing. But this guy's looking for the girl who went missing in the intro. And Vincent says that his great grandfather knew John Wilkes Booth while others are stalked by an evil surgeon. And then Vincent says that Booth actually didn't kill Lincoln, and that his great-grandfather did, and they figure out that Vinny is a vampire and possibly works at the Overlook Hotel. Here's the 14 years of being on the wagon. And it's also revealed that Vincent himself killed Lincoln, and eventually only Christina and her sister remain alive, but they both end up prey of Vincent, and there's no date in this one, so I'm just placing it in 2020. All right, from here on in are movies that I've not yet covered and are being featured here for the first time on this channel, and we're starting with the one that you've all been waiting for. 2020's Amityville Vibrator. This one actually starts in June of 1976, so after the Lutzes had left the famous house, and just kicks off right away with some really repulsive stuff that I cannot show you. 
a heavy set naked woman in a cow skull mask using the vibe of the title and then being shot by someone with a shotgun. The opening credits are literally on white paper, drawn with crayon, and pulled away by hands. We're in present day, so I guess 2020, and Kathy has moved into the house and says that a family was murdered there around 45 years ago, which would make this uh, 2021, but she did say like 45 years, so it could, uh, it could be 2020 as well. Kathy is given the vibrator by some dude at a yard sale, you know, like, like you do. And there's this couple hunting down haunted items and they're looking for the, the selfie stick and she and her friend end up using it to, together. And a random nun is not told to get out, but instead to get off, of course, but is then stabbed by a fly-eyed version of Kathy with the Steely Dan. And then some random slappy appears. And of course, she has sex with it. What the hell am I looking at? I was just wondering the same thing. The electric banana reveals itself as Satan, and it's told that Kathy is actually the daughter of the guy who killed the family there in the beginning. <laughs> the ending has the two hunters entering the house, and well, I can't show you this, so I guess I'll try to describe it. The dummy kills the guy, cuts off his face, and then cuts open the woman's stomach and uh, does stuff to it while wearing the guy's face. That is a scene that I watched in a movie and I am now having to describe to you and I am truly, truly sorry. <laughs> The tail end of 2020 also saw our next entry, an Amityville poltergeist, or I guess also just Amityville poltergeist, and it tells us that it's Wednesday, February 19th, which is how that landed in 2020. So that presumably is when this one is set. And Jim here is looking for a job and thinks he's found one, uh, house sitting for a sort of creepy older woman in her oddball family. Oddly, his friend gets a saucy text from his girlfriend that says it's February 9th, 10 days earlier. So I don't know. Uh, she took the pic earlier and sent it now. He goes to the house and creepy stuff starts going on. And the old woman is having a dream about a woman walking up her stairs. I suppose the house has Amityville-ish windows. I guess, maybe, if you wanted to stretch it, but the fact is that this movie was shot under the title No Sleep, and then Don't Sleep, and they didn't tag on the whole Amityville thing until it came time to distribute, so I'm not exactly confident that this one will have any links to the series. There's long stretches of pretty much nothing happening at all, like long stretches, but then, oh no, scary girl dreams like someone just watched a bunch of J-horror or something. And then, you want silly? Jim starts having an affair with his best friend's girl, and yeah, a whole movie that again thinks that classic thought of, oh hey, isn't it scary when people have their mouths open? A lot of the scenes are like they're trying to emulate the grudge, just not succeeding like in the slightest. Like by the end, they're really just redoing shots from the grudge. And I suppose thinking that no one would notice. The old woman, I guess, shoots her daughter and they find Jim catatonic and she shoots her son and then herself. But then, the, the ghost is there, the end. Again, there's no connection to the Amityville films at all. It's completely unrelated. This is another one that just had the title slapped on. <laughs> 
Our first 2021 entry was Amityville Moon, another one from Thomas Churchill, who just gave us Amityville Harvest and starts with a werewolf. And the opening credits have some shots of shops in Amityville. So we're set there again, but I guess we'll find out if this is in the same universe as Harvest. It then tells us that it's 10 years later and present day, so presumably 2021 and in Amityville. And there's this cop who's on suspension for using excessive force. So, um, a cop. And he's tasked to round up this girl whose paperwork shows her to be born in 1996 and the other girl he's looking for was born in 99 and the replacement Kristen is here and she's fairly unrecognizable she's a nun at a school for wayward girls and detective Kimball goes to a biker bar and this guy's here looking all intimidating and the werewolf occasionally shows up to kill the girls and it could probably stand to be filmed a little less direct with maybe a little less light and when Jennifer convinces him that the wolf is real, they go to the church, and a clipboard at least tells us that it's August 1st, and Sister Frances is revealed to be the lycanthrope and wolfs out. She starts killing pretty much everyone, and this board tells us that we're in the same universe as Amityville Harvest, since there's a note up about Vincent Miller. And it also tells us that it's set before April 2022, and it's revealed to be Father Peter's wife, but thankfully a gun with silver bullets is on hand. And there's no visible dates, just as the birth dates of our main character would make her 25 if this was real time 21. So since we know that it's August 1st and it's before April of 2022, so it's August 1st of 2021, sure. Next up in 21 was Amityville Cop from Gregory Hatanaka, who made Samurai Cop 2 and great now I have a headache and I'm not looking forward to this at all. It's this guy's 40th birthday and for some reason his girlfriend or wife looks around 20 and he gets pulled over by some sort of maniac cop and killed. And wait a second, this is LA, not Long Island. Is this actually going to be Amityville or is it just another title cash grab? Sidebar, if all these films are linked, how easy would it be to be an actual Amityville cop. Oh hey, another murder. This guy's dead. Looks like the devil did it. Oh hey, you're right. Case closed. The cop with his deep spooky voice kills a homeless guy and this cop gets a new partner and it's around New Year's Eve. And they talk about restrictions with numbers of people at the party, insinuating that this is taking place during COVID. So I assume it's the end of 2020 leading into New Year's 21 then. We see a flashback to 20 years earlier, and hey, speaking of maniac cops, Laureen Landon is here, and she sacrifices a police officer, which seems to create the demon cop. In a very realistic part of the movie, the crazy unhoused guy that they arrest earlier, who ranted about demons and such, uh, gets invited to the police officer's party. It's the New Year's party, so I guess we're into 2021 now, and AC shows up and kills the rookie. And I guess everyone only got one take? I don't think that's quite what he had in mind. And the captain tells the story that the thing is his former partner, and some other cop gets turned into zombie form, and the cap shoots him one time, which I guess kills him, but of course it didn't. And you know, this is one of the biggest offenders here because not only does it have nothing to do with Amityville, but it's not set in Amityville. And again, no one even says the word Amityville in this movie. It's just another one where the title was just slapped on. Moving on to the Amityville cult, which at least has the house uh, featured on the poster. But it's ITN, so I'm braced for bad. It's by Trey Murphy and appears to be his feature debut, so I guess if you're gonna get started in this wonderful world of filmmaking, doing an Amityville film is jumping in feet first. 
It starts with a guy in a robe killing someone, and then there's Stan here who gets an email from someone in Amityville saying he's inherited his grandmother's house, even though he never knew her. Turns out that Stan's last name is DeFeo, and his grandma's name was Marie, although neither of those names match up to any of the real-life DeFeos. He goes to the house, although nothing really looks like the New York area, and the house is, of course, nothing like the classic house, even though that's what is shown on the box art. Stan finds a diary that brings us back to 1965 with his grandmother moving to Amityville with her husband getting a new job at a law firm with this totally not creepy guy working there. She starts to have an affair with him, and honestly, uh, how can you resist this smile? And it's weird how modern 65 looks, but turns out that Smiley's in a cult along with this kid who I swear is mouthing pee pee poo poo. Smiley Guy's name is Osmo Deus, which isn't fishy at all, like that's his actual name. And Marie's now pregnant, so she leaves her husband. <laughs> Look at the modern car in the background. Clearly 1965 here. She gives up the child, which is Stan's mom, and there's plenty of those all-important time-filling walking around town scenes. Again, clearly not Long Island. In fact, the door of this coffee shop tells us we're in Texas, not New York. So I guess it's Amityville, Texas? They run into Marie's ex-husband, and he says, get out. So yeah, I guess it's connected, sure. There's more flashbacks, and it's odd because Jeremy here is a lawyer, so he went to law school. So he's like 25 and 65. So if this is modern times, it's 56 years later. So he'd be 81, which this guy ain't. This movie's real big on telling you stuff without showing it. Like, Jeremy talks about the woods attacking him and gives a description of it. But in the flashback, we just see him waking up. Soon, Stan is hearing Dr. Claw. And if Stan's mom was born in 66 like they say, and she died in the 30s, and Stan here is around 25 or so, maybe, maybe 30, real time setting of 2021 is pretty likely. The cult shows up at the house, and his girlfriend has always been a member, and I love that they're all wearing these satiny cloaks. Like, they had to go to a fabric store and order several bolts of this stuff, and the clerk at the counter was probably like, uh, you working on a project? And they were like, oh yeah, uh, cult robes. Turns out Marie is still alive too, clearly not in her 80s, but I guess the devil keeps you young, and she kills Jeremy. And here's an editing tip. Never use this transition. Oh, Just don't. And for heaven's sakes, don't use it twice. Or, um, over and over again. Then Marie commits suicide by cutting her own throat with the back of a knife, uh, somehow. And then, remember when I complained that this movie didn't show things and just told you about them? Well, this is what happens when they show stuff. So I will shut up because it's like the Amityville clown posse strolled into town. I guess Stan is taken over and uh, the end. Without a clear date, we're rolling with Real Time 21. And yeah, there's no connection to the Amityville legend except they say the town is un Amityville and the guy's last name is DeFeo. And they only really say that stuff in the very beginning. So it's possible that this film was shot under a completely different premise and that stuff was tacked on later to sell it. Our next 2021 entry was Amityville Vampire, which starts with a shot of the house. So all right, there's that. And there's a cleanup crew that's coming in. What we're told is one month after what appears to be the DeFeo killings shown way back in Amityville Toy Box. 
Weird stuff starts to happen to the crew, like one becomes a vampire, and if this is supposed to be 1974, then the hair and makeup are way off. But even more so, the level of film quality is off. This one is actually directed by Tim Vigil, comic book artist and co-creator of Faust, and it's his first foray into the film world. It's a sort of anthology, and there's iPads, so it's modern times, and a couple is going camping and not actually driving the car, since this guy is A, not wearing his seatbelt, B, barely looks at the road, and C, literally never moves his hand on the steering wheel once. He tells the story of a woman who works for Lilith A. Thanos, who's a millionaire, and everyone acts like that's this huge deal, like it's 1980 something. Like they say it like there aren't billionaires, and millionaire is like the highest achievement that one can reach. Her calendar tells us that it's 2018 and Gloria is seduced by her boss, and this reminds me so much of Veronica and those levels of not understanding how human beings interact with each other. Her boss is a vampire and kills her. The end. The next story is about Caleb who really goes for it, like really goes for it, talking to his daughter's grave, even looking straight into the camera? We pray every day. My wife, she's dying. She's dying. You can save her. I know you can. His wife is dying too, and some vampires show up in sparkly eye makeup, even though I think this is supposed to be a long time ago, and they turn his wife, and this isn't silly at all. And they kill him while stock sound effects play, making sure to not actually put their mouths near him. The end. In the wraparound, this woman has a handicapped placard that reads 2019, so I guess that's when the main story takes place, and our main couple goes camping, literally right next to the parking lot, where a gang has kidnapped a girl, and they kill Johnny, but their victim turns out to be a vampire, who attacks them, and Fran encounters all the people from the stories, and then gets bitten the end. And yeah, again, there's no connection to Amityville except the very clearly tacked on intro scene, which has nothing at all to do with the rest of the film. It has been way too long since we've seen an Amityville entry from Dustin Ferguson, with his last one being five years ago in 2017. And five years in Ferguson time is like 90 movies, but he's back with Amityville in the hood, because if the Lep can go there, then so can Amityville, since nothing says hood like the Long Island suburbs. I'm calling BS. We actually go back to the ending of Evil Never Dies or Clown House or whichever title you want to go with for that one. So the Ferg Amityville movies are a continual story. It says it's three years after that one and we put that in real time 2017. So that may put this in 2020 then. And a couple of guys break into the actual Amityville house, which for some reason is still there and not destroyed. And there's a bunch of weed there. They get killed by a rival gang, and then there's a prostitute and a gangland boss who says that he sent his guys to New York to pick up weed, and they've brought back the stuff from the Amityville house. And we're in Compton, and when the gang smokes the cursed weed, and hold up, because this girl has a tank top team jersey that just says balls on it, and then the 23. Like, is the team called balls, and she's player 23? The pot turns people who smoke it into these demon things, and for continuity, John Walker returns as newsman Peter Summers from Clown House. And this cop talks about the painting and the monkey, referencing the previous entries. And they say that the house is still standing and is now owned by the bank, and the weed plays havoc with pretty much everyone in town that smokes it. 
The cop passes by a site advertising the new Compton High School opening in 2023, so we're definitely before that, and he talks about the previous films, saying that they were a few years ago, and again, mentions some of the other official entries, and oh yeah, here we go! The good old fashioned 10 minutes of footage from the previous films, and this movie doesn't have any of the classic Ferguson strolling around town scenes, but it finds a replacement with driving around the Skid Row area shots, which is, yeah, way more depressing. <laughs> Big M heads to the house to get more of the evil weed, and the cop decides to set the house on fire, which he does by splashing a, a, a bit of gas on the ground and lighting it with a handheld lighter, which makes the whole place go up and which now has glowing green windows, of course, um, explode. But it looks like the weed is still for sale. The first one this year was Amityville Scarecrow, which was directed by Jack Peter Mundy, who is credited with directing five movies in 2021. So yeah, uh, this guy takes this girl to what is said to be the Amityville campsite, which they remark is on the same land as the Amityville house. And there's a scarecrow here, as advertised, and it comes to life and starts chopping. And then, wait, judging from this car's license plate and the accents, um, we're in the UK now? So this family is inheriting this old campsite from their deceased mother, which is on the site of the Amityville cornfield, which was built on the grounds of the classic Amityville house, which had burned down. Got that? I, I guess you could put this into continuity with the original series if you wanted, since whatever happened to the land the house was on was never discussed. This lady here was also in Witches of Amityville Academy, and they refer to the area as a caravan park, another notion that we're not in Long Island and actually in England, even though they repeatedly say they're on the location of the famous Amityville murders, but maybe not because they talk about the Richards family in 1972, even though the newspaper's from 1984, so I'm not sure why they'd be reporting on an over 10 year old story and put it on the front page. But then the story in the papers talks about how the land was turned into a summer camp and that it happened in the late 80s, a fact that they're reporting on in 1984, the early 80s. There's a ton of family drama because one thing I've learned by watching a bunch of British low budget horror, for some reason, they all have a ridiculous amount of family drama. They say that their mother bought the land and then moved them to the UK for 20 years to cover up the whole British aspect of the production and the scarecrow begins his attacks. And even though they're all literally standing by cars, they run inside one of the trailers to lock themselves in. And then we find out that one of the camp caretakers was suspected of killing a little girl, and they find a camcorder from 1993, and it's their mom who tells them that they had another sister. And in 1984, Lester the caretaker killed her and a couple of other kids. So the parents got revenge by, um, setting fire to him in his workshop. Why is this sounding so familiar? And she then says that they should never go to that land. Um, she says this on a videotape that she left on the land, you know, instead of shipping it to them to prevent this exact scenario. Uh, they very slowly face off against the scarecrow and he's like the worst villain ever. They, they hit him once with a shovel and then he just can't stand back up or whatever and they laid him on fire and that's literally it. They, they could have done that like 40 minutes ago um, they decide to keep the land, to keep the secret hidden, and there's no date in this one, so we're just going to go ahead and place it in real time 2022, and I will look forward to Amityville Scarecrow 2, apparently coming soon. <laughs> Next up is Amityville Uprising, which brings Thomas Churchill into the club of making three Amityville-based movies, along with Ferguson and Polonia. 
It has a sign promoting social distancing, so we're clearly post-2020, but we're in Amityville, and the radio even says it's Long Island, New York, which is weird since they have a restricted area that's protected by the California National Guard, so I guess they're just doing some long-distance guarding. There's an explosion that doesn't look just like a Snapchat filter, and police officer super saver Josh Brolin, and a quick flash of the morgue shows a bulletin board that lets us know that we're set around May of 2020, so like the height of the pandemic. And they're merging police stations, so this one's down to a skeleton crew, so I guess there's gonna be some sort of an assault, and it's a precinct that's numbered somewhere in the early teens. We're told that there's unusual activity in graveyards around Pittsburgh, and there's even a dangerous prisoner brought into the station at the last minute. But then it cribs from another horror classic since the explosion incident brings about acid rain with a toxic surprise that reanimates the dead, which seems to amount to like two zombies. And weirdly, when it all starts going down, this guy doesn't want to call for help because he thinks no one will believe him that there's zombies. Meanwhile, this is supposed to be citywide. They reported on it on the news and everything. Why would he think that they wouldn't believe him? Everyone gets chomped, even Dash's son, and the zombies get in, and that's it. It just really, really abruptly ends. Finally, this year also saw the release of Amityville Gas Chamber from writer-director Mike Stone. It's pretty much a parody of everything that we're talking about right here, as the premise is that since you could literally release anything that you want with the title Amityville on it, he made Amityville Gas Chamber, which is just Mike sitting by a very real fire and reading the Amityville horror silently. He occasionally farts, which I suppose is the gas chamber. And also some trivia will flash on the screen at the bottom about the series. There's also at one point, cute animals. It's tongue in cheek, but actually better than a third of the movies on this list. There's also been several movies that feature the events of Amityville without having it in the title. The biggest one of these is, of course, The Conjuring films, since, of course, the pretend demon hunters would go to the pretend demon house, and it's actually a fairly central part to the second of them. There's also one from 2015 called The Unspoken, which is set in 1997 and features a haunted house that's not the Amityville house, and it's revealed that there's an interdimensional evil presence causing the hauntings of this house, and at the very ending it shows them moving to Amityville, although I'm not sure exactly what they're saying because I could see if it was set in 74, and they were saying this kid is the cause of all the issues, but it's in 97, like 20 years after even the Lutzes were there. There's also Bloodbath at the House of Death from 1984, a comedy film that's a spoof of Amityville almost entirely. And there's a scene in Scary Movie 2 that pokes fun as well. If you're more interested in the true events and also the so-called true events of what happened on Ocean Avenue, there's plenty of documentaries about it as well, which obviously aren't part of the fictional timeline. Some of the most noted are My Amityville Horror, which focuses on one of the Lutz children's remembrances, and The Real Amityville Horror, but there's possibly just as many docs as there are fictional entries. Want to read more about it? Not only is there the original novel that everything is based on, there's a chain of follow-ups, including Murder in Amityville, which the second film was based on. The Amityville Horror Part 2, Amityville, the final chapter, which apparently means as much with books as it does with movies, and about a dozen or so more. There's a couple of comic versions, mostly adapting the original story, and a few years back, one of them, called Amityville Junior Graphic Ghost Stories, which got a little press as it was the subject of an angry parents group in North Carolina who found the book, which adapted the tale for young readers, inappropriate for children of any age. The kids at that school presumably said, oh sorry, we didn't hear what you were saying, we were at a school shooting preparedness demonstration. And oh yeah, in case you think my nightmare is over, according to IMDB, there's about a dozen more entries, most for 
just later this year, including the much-hyped Amityville in Space by Mark Polonia, making his fourth mark on the series. To nuke that black hole, that house must be destroyed. Amityville Karen, directed by Sean C. Phillips. Show me your work. Work, bitch, work. Amityville Thanksgiving by Will Calazzo Jr. from Bloody Nun Notoriety. Amityville Shark House by both Sean C. Phillips and Will Calazzo Jr. What the hell are you doing in my bed? Sam. Amityville Bigfoot, um, also by Sean C. Phillips. Amityville Hex, which was supposed to have been released last year, featuring Lloyd Kaufman. I keep hearing things in my head to do things. Amityville Clown. <coughs> Amityville Leprechaun. Let me say that again. Amityville Leprechaun. Amityville Apartment. The Amityville Exorcist, which is different than Amityville Exorcism. Amityville Ghosts. Amityville Outhouse. You shall not pass! Amityville Germany. Germany? Really? Amityville High. Amityville Slumber Party. Amityville Clown Car. And I'm sure about 20 more that I missed, but we'll surely cover in another episode. So there you have it, 100 episodes of Horror Timelines and 40-something movies of Amityville um, and more to come. Yeah, I guess this is my worst nightmare. But I wanna thank you guys for sticking through that entire video. I wanna thank you for uh, sticking with me through 100 videos and six years worth of this. I never would have predicted six years ago that I'd still be doing this. And I'm actually thankful that I can. I'm thankful for you guys that have been with me since the beginning. Thankful for you guys that have joined me along the way. And I'm thank thankful for you guys that have just found me like a week ago too. Um, You've really made this entire experience fantastic, especially you guys at patreon.com slash movie timelines. Um, fun little community we have over there. It's been a blast. I've made a lot of good friends. And doing this channel, uh, it, it's, it's, it's very important to me. Uh, it, it means a lot that you guys are enjoying it. It means a lot that I can continue to do it. Um, yeah, I don't think people realize like how how important that doing this is to me. I know I make a joke about watching bad movies a lot, but uh, but I really enjoy doing this and I'd like to continue to do it for as long as I can and as long as you guys will allow me to um, and will keep coming back and watching me talk about garbage um, that I, for some reason, enjoy watching. Well, thank you and we'll see you very shortly for another great video. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.